Okay, so we're going to remove some of these components because they are faulty. I've just metered them and they don't read right and one of them is reading an odd reading so I've got to take it out of circuit to check it. So it's these three here. Got to come out, be tested. Might put one of them back but easy just to change them all once I've taken them off. So we've got the hot air gun on. She's heating away nicely. Narrow tip, nicely directed jet of air. Okay. Diode. Oh, blown over there. To know. Stuff on my tweezers now. 300 ohm. And then over this side we've got the the other gate drive resistor, this one. Which is open circuit. Okay. So that's those removed on the system now. Okay, here's the diode in the low side gate drive circuit. If we put this on diode voltage drop there, that will just um, display the forward voltage drop of the diode junction. 194 milliamps, which would suggest a shot key, wouldn't it? There should be nothing on this one, because only two leads. This is a SOT23 package, but obviously being a diode, it's only got two leg legs connected. Um, 193 millivolts. If I just turn that round, that should, shouldn't should conduct at all. And it does. So that diode is shot. I mean, that should be about 200 millivolts both way, uh, one way, and then open circuit the rest. Okay, so that diode is, is gone, is destroyed. It has been destroyed by the electricity. So we need new shocky diode. I'll give you the part number of that one in a minute when I've uh, dug it out of the spares box. All right, and then um, the other two resistors were just open circuit, so there's nothing to see there. So back on to soldering back in place the new parts. So the diode, the switching diode in the gate drive circuitry is this one. It's really just an IN4148, I think, in a different package. It's made by several different people, all of which give pretty much the same stuff. The diodes incorporated one has actually got the right code number on the top. All the other national and everyone else is the same diode, it's got different numbers. So I'm, I'm going to stick with this. Um, so you can see it there, it's just an ordinary diode, fast switching diode. It's not shocky. I don't think. No, it's just normally uh, totally dead free, halogen free, this latest version of it, switch, fast switching speed. Obviously it's got to be fast. If you've got a lot of capacitance in there it wouldn't give the same repeatable results on the uh, gate switching currents which uh, need to be controlled to um, control the dead time. And um, yeah, so there we are, we've got KA2 there, look, and so it's the same device and year of manufacture and it's a uh, 100 volt um, PIV 75 repetitive uh, forward current 300 milliamps and the switching time, what's the switching time? Reverse recovery time, there you go, four, 4 nanoseconds should be quick enough for what we want. So that's the one, part number MMBD4148, yeah so it is a 4148, look or IN914, same thing. So it's not shocky, it's silicon, but that one's knackered. They're both knackered, actually. So I've got, I don't know if I've got any of those in packages or not. I'll have to check. But anyway, that's the one, so fit that. Well, the plot thickens. The uh, the original on semiconductor, I guess the original ones were Fairchild before they were taken over, um, are obsolete. So we're going to have to go with something else. And we've gone with uh, the on semiconductor version which is in stock. Okay, so it's not going to have the same um, KA2 marking, but it is available. So I've just ordered some more because I can't find the bags empty in the uh, in the stock tray. So tomorrow. Okay, I'm just going to quickly show you a, a method of manually soldering these, if you, just in case you don't have the uh, hot air gun. You can desolder and solder these okay with a decent soldering iron. If you've got an, an ordinary leaded soldering iron that only is designed to work with 300 
degree solder rather than the unleaded type solder, i.e. the 6040, then it's not going to be that straightforward and not that easy, but generally speaking, you can do this. And if you just put some flux on, which I just have, then touch up the pads with some leaded solder to make your life that much easier. And that pad, and that pad. And um, what you can then do is get your tweezers and just heat each pad alternative in an alternate way, one than the other. And you'll find that you can solder this on and you can get both pads molten at the same time. Yeah. Okay, so that one's gone on upside down, but it's fine. We know what it is. It's a 10 ohm resistor. Okay. So I'm going to put the rest on and we'll give it a clean. Alrighty, so we're going to take these three chips off. 317 uh, Fan 784 and the LM5021. Should be locked focus there. Yeah, focus is locked. Get some heating jollop. Right, so first of all, stick some flux on. The old Kingbow flux, we know about this. It's all getting old hat now. We're going to remove that and that and that as well because that needs replacing. We're going to remove that as well and this, okay? absolute minimum all right if you don't do that you want to switch it on it'll go fat again and then you won't be happy will you no you won't right so hot air gun on what we might do is call in the cavalry in the form of the soldering iron <coughs> let's clean my tip sometimes you hit a little bit of direct heat from the soldering iron can just speed things up with the hot air gun it just saves time Otherwise you get a bit bored, start thinking about something else and then something slips off or something happens and it's just not a happy situation, okay? So let's put it up there. As my hot air gun. Oh, yeah, it's burning a hole in the desk nicely. All right, so who wants to go first, girls? Okay, so let's start with the 317. Be fairly patient when you're doing this. It, you, it's not something you can really rush around, rush along, rush around. I've been rushing around all day. It's quite a big, heavy board, so when you get some heat in there, she'll get up to temperature, then you'll be laughing then, but you just have to wait. Oh. Yeah, I don't like to use too high a temperature really, so what I do normally you just bring in the cavalry in the form of the solder iron just to put that bit of extra heat in. You can see just touching those pins allowed it to flow. Just a bit of extra heat and now it should be easy to get it off. So there's the 317 gone. Don't disturb anything else. Chip number one, down and out. Fan 7384, the inside of this thing is going to be absolutely toasted I should think. If you've done all this and you know all this, then just talk amongst yourselves. So yeah, I can turn this thing up or I can make it more vicious, but it's just not worth it because the extra heat could stress some of the other components and you don't want that. You trouble with stress components is they fail later on. So these pins down there haven't melted yet, look. Talk amongst yourselves. A little bit direct heat might just tip her over the edge. There you go. Bit of accelerated heating up. Come on, I know you're close. Don't hold out on me. Just let it go. <laughs> and the football's starting. There we are. That's that one gone. Right, and while we're here, these are probably already molten. We're going to take that one off. We're going to take that one off. Oh, coming thick and fast now. We're going to take that one off. And we're going to take off this um, switching diode, the same as the other one, the KA2, I think. Take him off. And then down here, we're going to take. I'm going to check that one. I think it's probably okay. That one looks okay. And take off the seven, sorry, M5021. There you go. So all those Johnnies are going to languish in the graveyard. <laughs> Bye. 
bastards. Right, so while she's good and hot, get out your solder braid. There she comes. Not the best solder braid, but we've got a little do. And while the board's hot, a little bit more flux on the pads. And now we're going to just uh, put some a bit of solder. So here's the solder braid. We're doing this so that you can see what's going on because naturally I'd stick my head over the top and inhale all the beautiful fumes but I'm actually holding back here so that I can give you an idea of what's happening here so they're all nice and flat now okay so that's the thing let's get rid of all the old unleaded solder and put some juicy easy to melt leaded solder back on fuck's sake now let's just do this last one Don't pull it. Don't pull it. Okay. Now, that's okay. I think I'm going to take a bit more of these over this side. My solder lining is earth, by the way, so there's no ESD risk here, really, to speak of. I've got no synthetic materials on. I'm all dressed in cotton, not lycra. So toothbrush, isopropyl alcohol, soap pole area. Let's just zoom back a little bit there, so you can have a better look. There we are, so more of the old jollop. It's all dribbling over there. Give it a bit of a clean. Little bits of solder and detritus and the old flux come off. It's amazing how much better it looks after it's been cleaned. Bits of solder there looks stuck on. Alright, and the final thing to do is just hold it over the waste paper basket, like I am now, you can't see that. Throw that away. And just run some IPA over it to wash off the solution of flux and solder. So you want to wash it off with some clean IPA. And then when it's finished, it'll look like that. And all I've got to do now is just put the components back on. And I'm guessing quite a few of you guys won't have the uh, necessarily have a hot air gun. So I could sell them on by hand manually, if you like, um, just to show you how it could be done. All right. So I wouldn't normally do this. I'd usually use a hot air gun. But I'm going to show you the manual thing just to prove to you that it can be done with a standard soldering iron. And that you can uh, you can affect this repair yourself if you follow my instructions. And why wouldn't you? Let's face it. Right then. So next stage, I'll get I'll marshal these components together, and then we'll stick them on. Okay. First one to go on is going to be LM317. Uh, that's the radio spares. Radio spares part number six six one three six three zero. Right. So nice bit of. Um, flux on the on the pads make life easier make things go more smoothly is pin one marked on there everyone can you see a pin one marking can you see a pin one marking can I see a pin one marking interesting doesn't seem to be a pin one marking on that one they seem to have left it off don't they but there that is pin one because they're normally one of the rule to use in production is to have all the chips around the same way especially if you're laying the boards out if you start putting them all over higgledy piggledy in different orders, different positions and different locations, orientation with regards to pin one. It makes them a lot easier to, um, or a lot more difficult to inspect. And if you can and the inspectors look at all the chips and make sure they're all the same orientation as a human operation. It's a lot of it's done by automatic inspection these days, but as a human operation, it's easy to get them all on the same way around. It's not always possible when you're designing with PGAs and things with multiple pins because you just can't get the tracks around so sometimes you do have to turn them around but as a, as a rule it's much better to have things oriented in the same way like all your electrolytic caps with the positive at the same end that's the way around I'm going to do it and uh, we want manual focus focus we want you to focus no you don't right okay so are we lined up yes we are just about and what we don't the, th the secret behind this guys is not to Put the solder. I'm just going to nudge it into position here. The secret is not to solder on the pin. It's actually solder on the pad. So you heat the pad up, 
make the pad flow and then apply some solder to the pad. There you go. And that is pin one soldered. Then we go over the other side and we can do pin number five. One you go, come on. Number five. There we go. Two, three, four. Let it dwell long enough for it to flow. Let it dwell, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. Right, here we go. Number eight. Number seven. Number six. And I'm just going to do number five again. Right, so that's that component soldered on. All right. Go on, you were impressed, weren't you? Yes, you were. A little bit of glare on that actually. If I just cover that glare, you can see the sun, the light shining on it. But it's soldered, so that one's on. And now we've got to do the fan seven three eight four. Where is the sound fan? Yeah, I've got to find one. No, I haven't. It's here. Uh, um, there we go. So there's the label. I think that's a Farnell label. Order code. Oh. No order code. Manufacturer's part, quantity 5. Oh, here's the order code. It's the Farnell, if you want to look this part up. Uh, 208-3936 is the number that you want to order. I'll get through a lot of these things. Just get it out of the bag. Talk amongst yourselves while I do this. I'm just fighting with the packaging. Fiendishly clever chip, but boy, it's in a dangerous place. It's like standing in the middle of the motorway, electronics wise, waiting for someone to smash into you in the form of a transient, rolling you over and just turning you to mincemeat, blowing your insides out. That's what it's like, you know. You consider your electronic components when you uh, when you put them in. Just have some empathy for them, guys. Empathy. Take it all. I need to clean my brush, I've got dog's hairs on it again. Alright, I'm gonna grease up this one. This is gonna be a tour de force, that last one. Right, alright, okay, can you see? You can. So, just block your jobby on. Pin one is obviously around there. Oh, you can see that, can't you? Yes, you can. Remember, we're soldering on the pad, not touching the device to get the first pin anchored. Take my advice. Feel the force, it'll heed you well. So, let's do this one. Oh, come on. Right, first pin soldered. Is it lined up? Yes, it is adequately lined up. So let's just do the rest. Don't forget the flux. If you haven't got any flux, get some flux because it just makes life so much easier. Flux and isopropyl alcohol, you'll never look back. Certainly not in anger anyway. So I'm not even using a particularly fine tip, it's just the solder and the surface the surface tension of the solder is serving me, serving my evil purposes. So that's number two done. Number two. And where's my LM5021's gone? I've got a massive roll of them. I, I get through them about 10 a week, so I, um, I buy them in bulk and it's not in the normal store. So I'm just going to find that and I'll come back. Right, LM5021. There it is. That's the Farnell order number. Look, uh, Farnell, 25 pieces, uh, order code. And that's the order code there. 6533. No, that's not. Not right. One three one two five nine zero. That's the order code, okay? For these, so I'll uh, get one out the bag. I'm going to move this over slightly. I'm going to show you how this is done by hand. I'd usually, as I say, I would usually use hot air because I'm full of it. But on this occasion, we're going to do a manual job. So, assuming you've just got solder, I'm not even going to change my tip. I'm going to use my rough old tip for you. Yeah, so we're on macro mode there. It's not very macro is it? Let's just have a quick check of this. This might get fuzzy guys. 
I don't know what it's doing today. It's messing me about. We well, haven't got time. Got to get this thing back to France. Detente. Hopefully the, um, the guys in the yellow vests will let them get through to the final destination. So we've got a strip of these things, look. There they are. It's a very small component for the amount of voltages it's dealing with. Don't think they need to be that small guys. You could have made them a bigger, mm. made them easier to uh, fix. You have to watch out for these things because they've got a linear regulator inside. I think the 37 volts comes in, 8 volts comes out. And if you leave it in that mode where it's trying to start up and the regulator's producing current and trying and trying again, they, it doesn't take long before they actually just give up the ghost. I've been working on boards where this thing, I'm pretty sure hasn't been stressed, it's just over damaged itself because it's trying to start up and the linear regulator inside is only really designed to power, provide the power for the circuitry. You know, if that one or two seconds when the thing starts up and then after that the bootstrap supply takes over so the internal regulator isn't under any load okay so I've seen these where they it's been ticking away on the scope and I've been look, poking about thinking oh that's interesting look at that what's happening and then they suddenly start behaving completely different and I took me a while to realize what the problem was is that um is that focus still yeah is that the internal regulator had gone it doesn't like sitting there waiting to start up so quite often I'm halfway doing for a repair and it starts behaving differently so I have to go back and revisit it and then um, change this chip again. So on awkward ones you get through a couple of these. They don't like sitting there just the, with the regulator running. They like the bootstrap to come in and to the rescue and to, pr pr to provide extra power. Right, it's a bit of solder. Right, so I'd normally, make no mistake about this, I'm doing this for you guys, I would normally solder this with a what would I start with the hot air gun yes I would right so I'm gonna try this without the hot air gun just to prove to you guys that you can do it with a fairly blunt tip soldering iron the first pin they are first pin soldered did you see that can you see that can you see that that pin on the corner is now soldered the pin the chip is in position and just to say give you the scale of this is my finger look and there's half mil solder wire so we're talking fine pitch and it can be done it can be done but will I be able to do it that's the question so let's anchor the thing down properly as I said before can't say again too many times don't forget the bloody flux because without flux you'll be well, not very happy it won't be great okay now it's getting tricky. Now it's getting tricky. Touch it on. Bit of solder on your iron. The surface tension of the joint will take care of it. Seeker now she find. And just these two. Sorry I'm rambling. I'm trying to concentrate on this. Do that one. And that one. And that one. Alright. So that is a... What lead pitch is that? LM5021, wait a minute, let's have a look. I'll pop look at the. Um... Right, so it's uh, 0.65 pitch pins. Um, so the uh, the pitch is actually 24th hour, I think. 24th hour pitch, that, those leads. And they call it a plastic small outline package. So there you are, so that's that. So the next thing to do is to have a look at soldering the rest of these things. So I've got, um, I won't bother with the diode and showing you that. The diodes and the resistor and the capacitor, two resistors, a diode and a capacitor going on there. Um, now I'm just going to meet around these to make sure they're all okay. And yeah, so on the next thing here, I put the components back in, all the passives are back in, everything except the main power out transistors have been changed, okay? So they're all soldered in, so we're going to do that in a minute. But do you remember what I said about, um, well, we know when there's a, a zombie attack, there's always zombie zero, the first one. Well, I got a feeling that quite often the first cause of all this cascading failures and everything being overstressed might be this capacitor which is the one I talked to you about all the flux the transformer goes through this little Johnny so there's quite a lot of power being transmitted through there at the switching frequency it's obviously very high frequency well not very high but high frequency to, to uh, get the power to go through it because it's only a hundred nanofarad self-healing capacitor so let's um, 
first of all I've just desoldered it quickly there's no crack in the bottom sometimes you find they're cracked under here there's a split down the middle as it were it's 100 N 400 volts X9 capacitor what does X9 mean I'll ask you so I'll tell you in a minute so let's see let's get the probes on we're on capacitance this meter's not bad I've got a bridge got a Wayne Kerr bridge it's the right old Wayne Kerr but um, yeah it's 103 nanofarad that one's a good one so I'm going to put that back in I'm not going to waste a good capacitor on it but if you don't read a hundred or more they go down and down and down and down until finally there's nothing there and um, everything blows up so that's a good one so I'm putting that one back okay um, but do check it because it could be uh, zombie zero in your case in which case you could put the thing back together have it working for a while and then in a few weeks you'll back to square one just for the sake of a 30 cent capacitor so 100 nan 103 so 3% 3.8% out but the meters not that accurate so that'll do and I'll stick that back in okay so time to put the FETs back in I would normally at this stage um, power the unit up and check the drive signals to the low side FET and just check the rest of the electronics um, I'm not going to do that at this stage because presumably as I explained earlier you can't really do that unless you've got an isolation transformer because you cannot connect your scope ground or 0 volt line reference point to the, the AC 0 volts because it's reference to the mains and if you do it'll probably go bang or at least and if you've got a, a residual current breaker it will trip the breaker out so I've got an isolation transformer which decouples the mains from um, a conductive path uh, to your AC supply for the board okay but you can't do that unless you've got an isolation transformer so I, I advise to be very careful and watch the safety video which uh, is on the uh, Magic Smoke channel as well before you power this up um, just so you know what you're doing because it can be quite uh, hazardous alright so um, here's the FETs that are going back in that's the power fets, okay. Unfortunately, I've just noticed this, which doesn't fill me with confidence, but I have been using them for some time. And they are on semi stroke Fairchild, so presumably they're okay, all right. So they just go in here and here. These are about a pound or one dollar twenty each, okay. So without further ado, we'll stick those in and give it a whirl, see if she goes or not. So here we have the uh the pads onto which we're going to solder. You remember this one's got this nasty hole. If you haven't seen the first part of the video where we investigate this, this is burnt through here, uh, bored out from the centre of the FET and the FET's got a big hole in it. Is it that one? There we go. So you can see this is the one that's got the uh, internal parts. <laughs> it's been sputtered all the way through from the inside out like alien. Alright, so that's the one that was on that pad there. Now, I don't think there's anything shorting through from the internal layers. I hope not, anyway. Um, but we will see, won't we, when we power this up. So the first thing to do um, is to get some of the old flux. You know, like a broken record here, going over the same old thing. But flux makes life easier. Put a flux on there. And paint a little bit on the back of the transistors. And I would normally use a hot air gun to put these on, but I'm going to show you a method to do it with a soldering iron. So you need a decent soldering iron, heated up to 400 degrees centigrade. This is a 60 watt Weller. And these Weller soldering stations are about two or 300 pounds or 300 dollars. And we're just going to put a pool of 60-40 leaded solder on the pad. Not too much, just enough to make it a connection that will flow and you just place the transistor on there heating the thing up and just leave it for a moment or two for the heat to spread and for everything to get molten the transistor is heating up the solder is melting on the pad after put and you can you see that do this you see it move on its own that's the surface tension of the solder kicking in and then you can just move it into position gently and you might necessarily just to hold it in position 
Okay, so that's solidified, 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 and we're on. We're on. So now we just do the legs. One leg, two legs. That one's soldered. So say, make sure you leave the heat on long enough for the solder to solder onto the pad. So that transistor is now in place. It's as easy as that. This one's going to be slightly more complicated because of this issue with that hole that's been blasted in the copper track. All right. So again, some solder. Melt the solder on. It's just not as happy as this piece of tracking. Not very happy at all. I'm going to put a little bit more flux on that. And give it just a bit more of a clean with the old solder braid, I think. I just don't really, not really happy with the way that's wetting at the moment. It's called wetting when the solder flows on and, and alloys at the surface of the metal. And let's give it a little bit of a scrub. This is like a high temperature soft Brillo pad. Oops, any sparking and arcing or oxide, we can polish that off with the flux. Um, that looks a little bit better now, so but again, a bit more flux. Just a sad old man with a flux fixation. Alright, so again, apply some heat. Are we still in shot? We are. Okay, so here we go. We're going to put some solder on this. Like that. Problem's wetting there, look. Some flux onto the component again. job. A bit of starters. Solder, solder. Right, so apply some heat again, let it stabilise, let it melt. This transistor's heating up, solder's flowing, and you'll see the transistor float and possibly move. Okay, so that's Not as straightforward as the other one, is it? Because of the hole in the track. Come on. Possibly a little bit more solder required just to make a good connection. There we are. So it's all melted. Put this thing lined up. hold it down. If you don't hold it down it will float on the, on the pool of solder so if you put too much on you'll end up with a gap so it is necessary to keep it in position and then when she's uh, solidified just give her a solder her legs. There we are. Job done. So that's the, solder, the um, transistor soldered back in position. So I'm going to give it a quick clean then we'll just do a review of what we've done before we turn it on. Okay so I've just given her a bit of a clean um, just review what we've got here. We've got the two transistors we've fitted. We've got the uh, new resistors fitted. See the values. I haven't used a um, SOT23 transistor. I've used just an IN4148 diode. Exactly the same electrical properties, except it's a two-pin package. You can see the third pin, which is not normally connected on the transistor, has no connection inside the, t the um, device the KA2 uh, device but it's the same so it's just a 4148 4 nanosecond uh, signal fast switching signal diode okay so and then here I've put a larger version of the um, 50 ohm resistor on there so it's a normally uh, 0402 uh, device but that was before Bose changed the value down to 50 ohms so I put an 0603 in and just soldered it across the correct pads to make the correct connection. Otherwise, um, the, the 0402 is a little bit small. I, I wonder sometimes if they do just uh, destroy themselves. So that's why I've used a slightly bigger package on there. But it's the same values as discussed previously in the video. Okay, so this side, don't forget there is a heat sink which is required, this thing, to go back on. That solder's on there. That sits on there. 
just like that. Do you remember we took it off at the at the outset? We removed it. That goes on there, roughly like that. We'll put that back on later. It's not necessary to have that on there. I'm not going to bother putting it on until I know it's working. Otherwise, I'll have to change that transistor again if something goes horribly wrong. All right. And then on the other side, um, if I just flip her over, I just you can see the result of the the changes made on this side of the board. If I get it lined up correctly, which is over here somewhere. And what have we got? We've got these are just being put put back on. Uh, 600 ohms. 0.047 microfarads. I'm going to check the value of that. That should be a 10 ohm. That looks like one resist, one ohm out the pot. That came out of the 10 ohm pot. I'm just going to check that. It's a 10 ohm. That should be a 10 ohm. If it's not, I'll change it. We change this. We change this. I check this. I check that. I change this. I change that. Okay. So they're the components that have been changed on this side. These. This this, this, that, and that, okay? And everything else, I went around these diodes and transistors and just checked out to make sure they're still metering out correctly. Um, if you want to, there's plenty of information on the internet on how to check a transistor with a continuity meter. It's obviously not going to give you a 100% confidence, but with the voltage and currents floating around here, they'd probably just get destroyed rather than become leaky. But leaky can cause you a problem, but... So that's how we are. This is the original board that was shown in part one, okay? The French customer's board. So we're now pretty much ready to power this up. So without further ado, I'll get the, uh, the mains rigged up and then we can try it, take it from there. Okay, so I decided to do a few final checks before I power up and I found there was a very low impedance across this reservoir capacitor for VCC and this device here, which is the inverting um, I think it's a Norgate, it's an inverter anyway, it's used as an inverter and it's a Schmidt inverter, okay, and it's not a 5 volt one won't work, it has to be a 9 volt version which is made by Rome, I will put the data sheet up for you so you can see which one it is. So that was um, causing a short, and just poking around checking these diodes and transistors in this area, is uh, I found this one shorted which is a general purpose PNP. It's normally a MMBT3906, which is really almost a PNP version of the old BC108 for the people that remember those. But I didn't have any of the MMBTs in stock, so I used one of these, which is uh, that one there, the 1298YMTF. It's a uh, PNP. Um, it works just as well, but if you're going to order some to do the job, you might as well buy uh, order the MMBT 3906s. Okay, PMP general purpose audio 200 milliamp uh, transistor. Okay, so those two have been changed as well. And in addition to what we said already, they've just been changed. So we're gonna fire up the power in a moment and we'll try it out. Well, here you go, guys. Here's the uh, uh, single gate um, inverting. It's just an inverter, actually. I haven't looked it up. Hard to get hold of, but they've got them in stock at RS and Farnell at the moment. And it's the one, this is the key thing here, goes up to 16 volts. The other, everything else on the market I could find that was freely available was only a 5 volt part, maximum 6. Don't put a normal inverter in. Always use a Schmidt, because I've done that, and it blew the transistors up when I was searching around for this component. So there it is. It's uh, BU4S584GT from Rome. Very nice too. So you can see in the uh, insert, the picture in picture, you can see the uh, 60 watt light bulb <laughs> that's in circuit with the main supply for this thing. And then you here you can see, you know, sorry about the lighting's not great. What if I turn that on, that's gonna improve things slightly. Yeah, that should be all right. You should still be able to see the filament. At any rate, and so I've got the power on, and we're set to 220 volts on the Variac. Uh, the power is in, by this connector here. And I'm just going to power up and see what happens. So, contact. So we've got the flare up. We're drawing... Obviously the uh, filament didn't stay on, so... We're drawing 17.5 watts from the power supply at the moment. So if I just um, put this on 200 volts DC... Uh, check we've got some power coming in. 
Actually, that's going to be more like a thousand, isn't it? So, check the power. Yeah, I've got 318 volts on the unregulated um, DC rectified mains. And so, what have we got on the on the transistor itself? So, on the secondary side, let's just see if we've got anything on this. Here is the DC low voltage side smoothing capacitor. So, let's turn her over and just carefully probe across there. Yep, and we have 23.8 volts, which is correct. Right, so this is now working. It's fixed. All right. So what I did was just change those components I just told you, and that will generally sort your problem. All right. You might get the odd one or two bits and pieces gone as well, but usually this is a particularly bad one. So usually it's a subset of what we changed was necessary to change to make it work. So really, that concludes the repair. All I've got to do now is a load test on the on the board on the low voltage side to make sure that it can produce the power and solder this heatsink back on. I'm not going to touch this, it's switched on still, let me turn it off. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's done. So if you want to hang around, we'll do a quick load test. If not, that concludes it. I'll put the data sheet up in a moment for the, uh, the inverting shock geek 8, because it's very hard to find. I think I must have spent two or three hours locating that component. And the last time I checked, it was out of stock at Radio Spares, but more stock was due in, in uh, in February, I think, 18, or well, February 19. So uh, we'll do the load test and then we'll conclude. Okay, so there's the bulb we just repaired. There's two wires going off from the low voltage reservoir capacitor underneath, plus, plus and minus, going to the electronic load here. You can see the, the watt meter in the background, this thing. That's the watt meter, but we don't need that because we're measuring DC watts. But by looking at the DC watts being um, consumed versus the AC watts, you can get a ratio of the efficiency and the, a good indication of whether the thing's actually working properly. So once you get to know these balls, you can tell. Okay. Now, um, over there, is, this is the, the Variac. It's set to 230 volts now. And you can see that 9 watts, that residual, the power isn't on at the moment. That 9 watts at the moment is just the... Um, Eddie loss, losses in the Variac. Not the best Variac in the world. So this is only supposed to measure um, true watts rather than volt amps. I haven't checked it, but it's 9 watts. And this thing does get a bit warm when it's just sitting there humming away. So take 9 watts off whatever you read, okay? This thing is electronic load. And... Um, it's basically a programmable load that takes power and you can con set it to constant current mode or constant voltage mode. Um, we're going to go in constant current. The off light is, <laughs> they have a light when it's off rather than a light when it's on, which is strange. And you can display voltage and current or current and watts, right? So um, let's just go on voltage at the moment. It should be about 23.8 volts. So I'm gonna, I've taken the bulb out of circuit. The bulb is over there in that direction, that way. Um, the bulb is over there. We're still going through an isolation transformer, but that shouldn't affect the performance. And um, the bulb is now switched out. So that switch I drew on the diagram is now gone. It's gone, All right? Okay. So let's just try it. Power on, contact, and then, okay. Well, that was plug wasn't in properly. Sorry about that. Um, you got 22 and a half watts, so the thing's drawing about 12 and a half watts. And can you see the voltage on DC capacitor is 23.9 volts at the moment, right? 23.9 volts, 22.5 watts. That's quiescent. The thing, so let's try, let's take a load. So let's turn the output on. Actually, before that, we'll set the set the set point. So the set value in this case, because it's SV set value because it's constant current. It's set to, when I turn that, you can see the set value. If I move that over that way, that way even more, I can put it down to zero, okay, and then that way. So when I turn this on now, it will take no current, okay? This is used for testing power supplies. I've got I've got a 150 watt one and a one and a half kilowatt one of these for big power supplies. 
So I turn the power on, um, 23.93. So if I turn this now, you can see the current start to increase. You can see it racking up. And if I let go, you see the voltage is being maintained. We've got 0.129 amps, okay? And you can see the wattage on the watt meter at the back is going up, the AC watts going in. So as I turn it up more, So we're now pulling 0.319 amps, and if I set the view, uh, view, and uh, set voltage and watts. So here's the set voltage and there's the watts. Okay, so I can now turn this up at watts wise, and then we can check the voltage. So turn it on, and we're taking 7.6 watts. So 7.6 watts DC being drawn out of the DC low voltage side of the power supply. Now it's gone up to 10 watts. I wonder what she'll fold at. She will she will start to fold soon. So I'm gonna test it up to 30 watts and then we'll call it a day. So we're up to if I go view again I can check the voltage. So it's still regulating, it's dropped to 23.75, but we're pulling 0.78 amps and we're pulling 18 watts out of the thing. So let's go up to 25 watts. 25 watts. If you do the math, you can work out what the voltage is. That's view now. Yeah, so yeah, it's taking uh, still 23.68 regulation, and we've got a constant vol uh, current drain on the low voltage side, 25 watts. So let's go up to 30 and call it a day then, I think. This thing is obviously working. The regulation is good. The voltage is being held up. 30 watts now, constant 30 watts. Look at the view 23.65. It's dropped 0.15 of a volt and it's pulling 1.275 uh, 9 amps and we've got 23 sorry 30 watts so that's working I think so I'm going to turn that off now 30 watts current and that's a lot of loud music at that constant current that's a big demand on the power supply because real music would be pulsing and peaking and at the moment I'm driving it pretty hard I don't want to go harder than that so that's a repair that's fixed okay so just turn that off. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed that um, and found it useful. I hope you can keep some Bose Soundlock 10s out of the, uh, the rubbish heap. If you need any help or components, then um, contact me. I can easily sell you a set of components at a reasonable cost. And if there's any interest from people all around the world, I actually do run a company, but not, this isn't a commercial interest. This is just for putting out there these... Um, these videos on repairs but we do post internationally every day and for a very um, for most cost of the components I've got lots of spare components so I've been buying them in bulk if you need a set a full set of components then drop me a line and um, we can sort something out I have to it's not commercial it's to help you out with your repairs okay because these Bose sound lock tens are very good and they are I if, judging what people tell me from around the world they're difficult to get them repaired so that's it. If you follow those guidelines, I think probably um, nine times out of ten, or even more than that, you'll end up with a working board. But do be careful with the mains. Don't do any take any risks. And if you're not sure what you're doing, don't power the unit up on the bench with all the electronics exposed because some high voltages in there. And finally, just a request from me, uh, just to spur me on to do more, um, if you could just subscribe. And then when something else comes up, you'll get the next video. So hope that was useful. And that's uh, me signing off.